Uh, welcome to Lake Toxaway United Methodist Church and this service of worship. By way of announcements, I'm going to move through them quickly. The first announcement, please give attention to sign-up sheets in the fellowship hall. I appreciate your attention to that, and I uh, hate that I have to always ask, but I appreciate giving attention to the sign-up sheets that are in the fellowship hall. Also, uh, many of you have been in prayer in the last few days for Carol Guffey. I just heard from Amy just a few minutes ago. That's Don and Carol's daughter that lives in Atlanta. She, the transfusions were helpful yesterday. She's preparing to have a colonoscopy tomorrow. And hopefully what has caused her shortness of breath is not a cardiac issue, as they suspected. Hopefully they'll find something that can be repaired. Um, so I would ask that we hold uh, Carol and Don uh, in our prayers uh, today and tomorrow. And I know as I have information, I will pass it to Marty Young so that many of you can receive that information. Are there other announcements we need to make? If not, the reason we have gathered is to worship, so let us stand as we worship. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Christ is with us. Be to God. And our hymn of praise is hymn number nine in the supplemental hymnal. Continue as we join in this historic confession of our faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. 
The third day he arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Appointed scripture passages uh, before you, and I would invite you to follow along as together we read and hear God's holy word. The Old Testament lesson is from Joshua chapter 3, verses 7 through 17. We've skipped over massive amounts of the story, but remember we followed the people who have now become known as the um, nation of Israel, I would suspect, if you a little early to call them that but they left uh, Egypt, they've been in the desert for 40 years, Moses was their leader along with Joshua if you remember Moses lacked um, when the, there was a report of 12, of 12 groups of men who went into the promised land and they came back saying that the people were large in number, large in size, and so Moses and the people had anxiety about not going into the promised land. So for 40 years, they wandered in the desert. Moses has died. Um, he doesn't get to go into the promised land. And now Joshua is the new leader, and we are reading the story today of Joshua and the people passing into the promised land. So let us give attention to the lesson. So the Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to make you great in the opinion of all Israel. And then they will know that I will be with you in the same way that I was with Moses. You are to command the priest to carry the covenant chest as soon as you come to the bank of the Jordan, stand still in the Jordan. So Joshua said to the Israelite, Come close, listen to the words of the Lord your God. And then Joshua said, This is how you will know that the living God is among you and will completely remove all these groups of people who live in the promised land. Look. The covenant chest of the ruler of the entire earth is going to cross over in front of you in the Jordan. Now pick 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one per tribe. The soles of the priest's feet who are carrying the chest of the Lord, ruler of the whole earth, will come to rest in the water of the Jordan. And at that moment, the water of the Jordan will be cut off. The water flowing downstream will stand still in a single heap. So the people marched out from their tents to cross over the Jordan. And the priests carrying the covenant chest were in front of the people. And when the priests who were carrying the chest came to the Jordan, their feet touched the edge of the water. Now the Jordan had overflowed its banks completely the way it does during the entire harvest season. But at that moment, the water of the Jordan coming downstream stood still, and it rose up as a single heap very far off, just below Adam, which is a city next to Zarephath. And then the water going down to the desert sea, that is the Dead Sea, was cut off completely. So the people crossed opposite Jericho. And so the priest carrying the Lord's covenant chest stood firmly on dry land in the middle of the Jordan. 
And meanwhile, all Israel crossed over on dry land until the entire nation finished crossing over the Jordan. Here in the ends of reading of the Old Testament lesson, we will read the Psalter lesson responsibly, which is from Psalm 107. Give thanks to the Lord because he is good, because his faithful love lasts forever. And the ones God gathered from various countries, from east and west, north and south. They were hungry and thirsty. Their lives were slipping away. God, lay, God led them straight to human habitation. God turned rivers into deserts, watery springs into thirsty ground. Fruitful land into unproductive dirt when its inhabitants are wicked. But God can also turn the desert into watery wilderness, thirsty ground into watery springs. Where he settles the hungry, they even build a city and live there. And our epistle lesson continues in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 through 13. In the very beginning of this letter, Paul writes, You know what kind of persons that he and those with him proved to be for the sake of God. And now he continues building upon uh, them using what the Thessalonians would have known were was kind of philosophy of uh, individuals who were popular in uh, the day in which he's writing and he is uh, honing in now more firmly into the gospel of Christ. So you remember brothers and sisters our efforts and hard work we preach God's good news to you while we work night and day so we wouldn't be a burden on any of you. You and God are witnesses of how holy, just, and blameless we were towards you believers. Likewise, you know how we treated each of you like a father treats his own children. We appealed to you, encouraged you, and pleaded with you to live lives worthy of the God who is calling you into his own kingdom and glory. We also thank God constantly for this. When you accepted God's word that you heard from us, you welcomed it for what it truly is. Instead of accepting it as a human message, you accepted it as God's message, and it continues to work in you who are believers. Here it ends the epistle lesson. Will you stand for the reading of the gospel? So Jesus has been in this uh, contentious discussion, if you will, with the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and Jesus has demonstrated to them that they lack uh, understanding of parts of the Hebrew Bible, and then we have Jesus now speaking, following having silenced the Sadducees and the Pharisees. So then Jesus spoke to the crowds and his disciples. The legal experts and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. Therefore, you must take care to do everything they say, but don't do what they do. For they tie together heavy packs that are impossible to carry. They put them on the shoulders of others but are unwilling to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do, they do to be noticed by others. They make extra wide prayer bands for their arms and long tassels for their clothes. 
They loved it in places of honor, at banquets and in the synagogues. They loved to be greeted with honor in the markets and to be addressed as rabbi. But you shouldn't be called rabbi because you have one teacher and all of you are brothers and sisters. So don't call anybody on earth your father because you have one father who is heavenly. Don't be called teacher because Christ is your one teacher. But the one who is greatest among you will be your servant. All who lift themselves up will be brought low. But all who make themselves low will be lifted up. This is the word of God for the people of Christ. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Will you join me in prayer? Holy God, we give thanks to you and to you alone for the opportunity to be together in worship. We are mindful of prayer needs among us, both those we have shared already and those that we hold close. We are mindful that you are a God who hears before we speak, yet you ask us to speak our needs. So now in these moments, may your sacred word speak once again to us, and may you continue to make us more and more into your image and into the body of Christ. We ask it in the name of our loving Savior. Amen. So I've already told you, Jesus has just finished confronting for really the final time in the Gospel of Matthew the religious leaders who you remember a few weeks ago we we read the passage where it said they were beginning to find a way to catch Jesus in some kind of error so that they would have reason to kill him or to put him away. Remember, it kind of started with the question about are you to pay taxes to Caesar and Jesus responding by asking for the coin. And so today we move where Jesus is no longer interacting with religious authorities, but instead is interacting with the crowd of people and with his own disciples. And he says to them that they do not want to be as the religious leaders. In fact, he begins with the words, you must take care to do everything they say, but don't do what they do. Now, if we're honest, some of us have parented that way. Oh, okay, fine, you don't want to admit it. We have said to our children and our grandchildren, our nieces and our nephews, the children that we have had, in, that we have influenced, we have said, this is what you're supposed to do. And then we've not done it. And we've said to them, so don't follow my example, but do what I say. You're not laughing because you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> And Jesus has been very, very strong in his words about the scribes, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees. He has used a word that I don't like to say, but it's a word that is in the gospel. He's used the word hypocrite. And here becomes the problem. 
it's easy for me to look at these religious authorities or for that matter anyone else and to see others as God's enemies and to see myself rather smugly as an individual who is attempting to follow Christ. There's been a great deal of prejudice over the centuries against Jews and Matthew, in writing his gospel, already is aware of that because by the time this gospel is being written, the Jews and the Christians are separating and the Christians are beginning, in some ways, to be rather negative about the Jews and those who keep the law. And so it's important to remember that that's the context, or one of the contexts, that Matthew is addressing in his gospel. And if we're going to, if I'm going to state that, then I need to say to you, we need to also once again ask the question, who were the scribes and Pharisees? Well, the scribes were the biblical scholars. They were the ones who studied in the original language and who tried to understand what, and of course at that time it was just the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible, what the Hebrew Bible said. And the Pharisees, if you will, were primarily laypersons who were intent on keeping a strict adherence to the law. And one of the ways they wanted to do that was in some ways to build a fence around the law, and they even made additional rules to, us, to try to help people from violating God's laws. <clears throat> and the Pharisees often were tempted to look down on people who did not keep all the strict guidelines and to be rather critical of them. Now, please hear me. By no means were all Pharisees intolerant and self-righteous. But Jesus is addressing in the Gospel of Matthew those who obviously did consider themselves self-righteous and who were intolerant. He says they desire places of recognition rather than carrying the load or that backpack is what it is, but that backpack really is a descriptive word meaning the law and all those things that were involved in keeping the law. And by the way, you if you don't know this basic point of history, you forgot it from taking New Testament. Remember somewhere around A.D. 70, or now you'll read um, C.E. 70, but somewhere around there, the temple was destroyed, right? And there was a Jewish revolt. And most of the religious, Jewish religious groups disappeared except for the Pharisees, and they became even more significant. And it's in this period that scholars say that Matthew's gospel was written. So Matthew's concerned not just about the way things were in Jesus' time, but with the situation that the church had to face in that particular time. I'm sorry I've had to get so much into historical background, and some of you like history, so you've enjoyed a little bit of history lesson and the teaching. Others of you were like me, you suffered through it. <laughs> but I think it's important to set all that historical background so that we can understand 
what Jesus is teaching or saying in this particular passage. And I would just remind you that most religious controversies or most religious disagreements occur over what? Doctrine. Right? What we believe. The Reformation was a disagreement about doctrine. The continuing four movements, depending on who, you're, um, who you study about Reformation, but the continuing four movements of the Reformation were about doctrine. Some were more doctrinal than others. We as Methodists and as, therefore, as people who come out of the Anglican tradition, we are a part of that fourth movement of the Reformation, and our movement comes not only out of doctrine, but also out of practicality, right? Do you know what I mean? You don't find out what I mean by that. We had a little issue with a need for a divorce and an heir to the throne. And so our part of the Reformation Yes, had to do with doctrine and divorce, but it also had to do with a practical kind of matter. All of our church battles, if you look at them, in my opinion at least, are related to doctrinal disagreements. And one of the problems when we get too intent on observing doctrines is that we put ourselves in a position where we sometimes forget that it's not about doing what is right according to the law but it is about grace and about the love of God given to us amen I confess that I grew up in a tradition that required a lot of rule keeping. And thus sometimes the rule keeping became more important. The doctrines behind the rule keeping became more important than the love, grace, mercy, justice that was behind the doctrine. And Jesus says the problems, therefore, with the religious leadership, the Pharisees and the scribes, is that they say, do what we teach and don't do what we do. So what was it they were teaching and what was it they were doing? The scribes and Pharisees were quite legalistic and very good intended, if that's a word, at times. I mean, they even went so far as to tithe mint, dill, cumin, Herbs, just common herbs. So if we were living in that kind of legalistic background where you're supposed to bring in the first fruits of your harvest, some of you who have those herb gardens that are quickly going to be gone, right? You would have brought today mint, because all of you have mint to put in your juleps, and you would have brought mm -hmm, and you would have brought in some of you have rosemary, you would have brought those things and brought them in to worship. The Pharisees were so intent on those kinds of issues that they neglected the weightier matters of faith. That of grace, love, mercy, and justice. 
They wanted to enforce all the rules of the law of Moses. But they did not want to translate those laws into living lives that reflected the love of God. And remember when Jesus was asked, what, can you sum up all of the law? How would you sum it up? How did he respond? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. And the second is likened to that. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And yet the scribes and Pharisees spent hours imposing laws upon people while at the same time exploiting for themselves loopholes. Or, as Jesus says, they spent time focusing on the letter of the law while at the same time they liked adding all these fanciful things to the clothing they wore, to their robes, so that you would notice them. They liked having positions of honor. By the way, the seat of Moses is a real seat in the synagogue. You know that, right? And so when Jesus says they like to sit in the seat of Moses... Can you imagine what the seat of Moses would be? It would be a position from which you taught. We make an assumption when Jesus went to the synagogue in Nazareth, in his hometown, and you remember he read what we believe was probably an appointed text for that day, and he sat down and said, This day, in your hearing, this word has been fulfilled. Jesus was probably, we assume, sitting in the seat of Moses. And unlike today where preachers or priests stand, when you were teaching, when you were preaching, you were seated in the seat of Moses. So they liked, the scribes, the Pharisees liked that position of honor so much so that they were seeking after that rather than loving God with all their heart, soul, and mind and their neighbors as themselves. It's a temptation that any leader in a church has. But it's also a temptation for any parishioner too. We can easily follow the rules and consider ourselves smug and even exalt ourselves. rather than humbling ourselves as a servant. Many of you know that I go to worship with my family, um, the remaining children that are still at home. Um, and isn't it interesting, even that remaining child, the closer and closer they get to leaving, the less they are at home. I think this weekend my daughter who's home has been in our house maybe a few hours, I'm not sure. <laughs> she and her girlfriends can always find things to do together. But you know that I go to another church, and when I go to that church, I'm usually a little bit late. My wife and my daughter sit on one of two front 
pews. <laughs> now, I could walk in the center aisle and call attention to myself and like to say, look, I'm here, everybody. I've already preached. I've celebrated communion as we will do in a minute. I'm here. Praise me because I made it today. Or I can choose to wait until the congregation is standing and singing a hymn and walk down the side aisle and quietly come into my seat and realize that really my position is no greater or no less than anyone else's. It is a position of a sinner in need of the grace of God. And the cure for our desire to be recognized, and I, we all need to be recognized, and we all need affirmation, but the cure sometimes for wanting to be overly recognized and overly treated for being the people of God comes in grasping the words of Jesus that say the greatest among us will be your servant and that we will have one teacher and the one teacher is the Messiah and Jesus came not to seek a position that was exalted. But he came to serve, even to serve as one who went to the cross to embody God's love for us. And as we gather this morning at this table and remember the work of Christ, maybe we be acutely aware that we come humbly with our hands outstretched, outstretched, not because we deserve to be here, but because we are invited to be here. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen and amen. We continue together in worship as we have the opportunity to give our tithes and our offerings.
gracious God, we respond to your great gifts to us by offering these gifts to you. We bring gifts of money, of time and talents, and the gift of our lives. May they declare your praise in ways that sweeten lives with the love of Christ. Amen. Remain standing and we will sing our hymn of preparation, hymn number 622. It is the tradition of this church to celebrate Holy Communion on the first Sunday of each month, and today also in many Protestant churches is known as All Saints Sunday. So the liturgy will include naming three people that were connected as either affiliate or members of this church who have died in the past year. There also will be a time of silence. You are welcome in that time of silence. If you have lost a loved one, 
to speak their name uh, out loud. If you don't want to do that, in a time of silence, you may at least call them to mind uh, for yourself. In this tradition, communion is open to all people. There is a confession of sin in the Lord's Prayer, so we use that. We come using the center aisle, um, and I will come and give you an individual piece of bread. Uh, one of our former lay leaders will follow with a cup. We take communion by intention, which means you dip the bread. If you're able, you may kneel, but you also may stand. Stay here at the altar till everyone has received the elements, and then return to your seats using the exterior aisle after I have given each group a brief blessing. So let us now prepare to receive not um, a meal of the church, but it is the meal that Christ gave to us. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, God of Abraham and Sarah, God of Miriam and Moses, God of Joshua and Deborah, God of Ruth and David, God of the priests and the prophets, God of Mary and Joseph, God of the apostles and the martyrs, God of our mothers and our fathers, and God of our children to all generations. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. And on the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to God, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to God, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body of Christ and the blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. Renew our communion with all your saints, especially those whom we name before you. Bill Noyes. Mary Ann Jim Stewart.
since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Strengthen us to run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And with the confidence of the children of God, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. The feast is ready. Come as the ushers invite you. May we leave this altar remembering that it is not what we do. It is what Christ does for us. And he claims us in his love. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Humility is a concept hard for many of us to understand. And yet we remember that Christ in humility went to the cross for our salvation. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Having been fed and nurtured in the spiritual presence of our Lord, go walking in his light. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus loves you. Go knowing that you are redeemed by his love and the work he did for us on the cross. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Together, let us pray the communion prayer. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves to others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We stand and we will sing the closing hymn, hymn number 723.
privileged to have had the teacher of our Lord and Savior. And we are privileged now to leave and go into the creation, this wonderful world in which we have been placed to live as his children. We go in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.